Welcome to episode 14 of the hard truth of about B2B e-commerce. I'm your host, Isaiah Bollinger. Uh, unfortunately, Tim, our co-host is not available today. So we're just going to go ahead and, and uh, get going with the podcast. So uh, before we get started, I want to mention our sponsor, uh, Punch Out To Go. Punch Out To Go is a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce platforms with e-procurement and ERP uh, applications. Punch Out To Go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate, automate the flow of purchasing data. Uh, so with Punch Out To Go, you can immediately reduce integration complexities uh, for Punch Out catalogs, uh, electronic, electronic purchase orders, e-invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents. So a great solution in the B2B e-commerce space uh, and uh, a great uh, partner and sponsor that uh, we've been in touch with for, for years now. So if you don't know Punch Out To Go, please uh, get in touch with uh, their team and, and Brady, their CEO is, is a great guy to talk to. Um, so without further ado, I'm really excited uh, for today because we have a, a special guest uh, for, for uh, all of you who don't know Justin Finnegan. Uh, Justin, you're actually uh, with an, uh, a new company now, uh, and in your career, you've been at agencies in the in the B two B world pretty much your entire career. So, uh, you've been uh, you've been in B two B commerce for a while, and now now you're on now you move from the agency side to uh, the technology side, as you call the the dark side. I think. <laughs> so, can you tell us a little bit more about that? That uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about this kind of stuff. So, yep, I uh, I recently started to lead, um, you know, the client uh, services for a technology firm called Connexium. And, um, you know, on the one side, it, it is a bit of a change moving the technology side, but realistically, I'm, uh, you know, the problems we're solving are, are very similar. Um, so Connexium is a, uh, an automation platform that's, you know, providing true automation for manufacturers and distributors. And it's a really interesting problem. So there's 17 billion, 17 trillion, excuse me, uh, dollars worth of B2B transactions, uh, every year, eight and a half trillion of those are processed manually. Wow. So. The rest are are handled by EDI, by handled are handled by uh, B two B commerce, are handled by uh, technologies like Punch Out to Go, which is a, a partner of ours. Um, but the you know a, a very significant percentage are still handled manually by companies passing documents to each other, and you know what happens is somebody sending in a purchase order in an email or a PDF or a Word document or an Excel or whatever, and somebody has to take that, print it out, you know, turn their swivel chair and type it right back in. And it's a, you know, a huge amount of friction and a huge amount of cost. And Connexium uh, has a uh, true intelligent automation solution that removes that for, a, you know, especially manufacturers and distributors where we can extract the, uh, the data with a 100% accuracy. We can perform whatever transformations need to be done, and we can put that directly into our customers' backend systems. So uh, it's, a, it's a neat solution. Uh, we can implement it pretty quickly. We remove a lot of cost. We speed the cycle time. We remove the errors. And uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of really satisfied customers. That's awesome. Yeah, I was gonna say it, it sounds like uh, one of the big problems could also be a lot of errors. Like when you're doing lots of manual processes and you're dealing with all these orders, putting in the wrong number, the wrong skew could that could probably cause a lot of problems. I'm guessing. <laughs> well, if you you know just judging by the emails I've sent you, you can see how many typos land up in those. So uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's probably a fair fair case. So um, so I want to talk also a little bit about your background. Um, before Connexium, because that's a more recent move. Um, you know, you've kind of been in the trenches at a few agencies now, and some of these are some pretty impressive agencies, uh, companies that actually at Trellis we've kind of looked up to, especially while we were smaller and we're like, 
who, you know, who are the people doing a good job in our space? And, and some of those were those, were those companies. So tell us a little bit about that and kind of how you got into B2B e-commerce. Cause probably when you started, I don't think B2B e-commerce was much of a thing. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've, I've been, uh, I've been in the commerce space for over 20 years now and, um, you know, came to it, you know, little accidentally. So started my career in consulting and, uh, mostly working, uh, with customers, ERP, uh, projects. And, uh, in 1999, we had a customer come to us and said, you know, we think we want to try this e-commerce thing. Um, and we ended up building them, you know, their first generation e-commerce system from scratch. And that was a, a B2B system, uh, cause there wasn't any. Wow. So you, you started really, you, that was probably one of the first B2B e-commerce sites out there. Probably. <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was pretty close. I, I think we called it a portal. So that's how, uh, that's how <laughs> early days we were. And, uh, you know, we had to sort of learn, you know, how, you know, what are the pieces you need? Well, you need a catalog. Well, you need a, a checkout. Well, you need pricing, you need all these things and build them. And, 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 you know, thank God, 20 years later, you don't have to, you know, do that from scratch. There's, you know, a lot better ways. Um, but it was an early introduction to uh, the e-commerce world. And uh, I said, this stuff is pretty cool. And, you know, there may be, uh, it may be a career in here. And I've been doing it for 20 years. So uh, from uh, there, I, I was at a, uh, a company called Patachi Consulting for a number of years leading uh, e-commerce projects, moved to a agency in Chicago called Acuity Group. Um, which has since been acquired by Accenture, um, where we really were um, kind of the first, you know, specialist, uh, you know, agency that combined both the, the technology and the, you know, experience side in North America, did some of the, you know, very early large scale B2B projects, uh, you know, for some, you know, very, very big organizations. Following that, um, had the opportunity to uh, help lead a company in, also in Chicago called Gorilla Group. Um, so uh, Gorilla is a e-commerce uh, service provider or e-commerce agency, or you know, we never really could uh, decide what to call ourselves, but um, <laughs> you know, became uh, the leading. Uh, uh, you know, B2B agency in North America, independent B2B agency in North America. And, and really, uh, you know, our competitive set was, you know, the global players. So, um, you know, did a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, we sold Gorilla to uh, Wonderman Thompson uh, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, it's still a great growth story. And, uh, you know, if you're looking to do uh, enterprise B2B, they're, they're, they're the sharpest, uh, you know, the sharpest folks, uh, outside of trellis. <laughs> yeah, you guys, uh, you guys got to a pretty, pretty massive scale. Um, so it's pretty, pretty awesome to see the stuff that you guys are doing. And, and I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of competitors out there, but I like to look at it as like, everyone's kind of bringing things up and uh, in, in a good way for us. So the more that uh, Gorilla is helping move the needle up for all the B2B commerce companies, it forces all the other companies to realize they got to do something and maybe hire trellis or something like that. So, um, so I think we've all kind of helped each other in one way or the other without actually realizing it. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you've seen out of the evolution of B2B e-commerce. Um, you mentioned like, okay, 1999 was like a portal that was just kind of like an idea and like no one really knew probably what it was going to really do for them. They're just like, Hey, let's try this out. And now it's like, most companies I would say at least know it's something they got to do in terms of their strategy or they're thinking about it where they probably already have it. Yeah. I, I, I think we've gotten to the point uh, in 2020 where it's recognized as a necessity, not uh, you know, not something that we're going to try. It, it's something that uh, you know, we have to do. Uh, and most B2B organizations are there. And I actually think that's, you know, that, that's a bit of a recent uh, development. I think even if you go back three or four years ago, um, you know, it was still, you know, considered innovative um, for a lot of companies. And, 
Um, I think actually one of the interesting, you know, we, we've looked at this a bunch and talked about it. One of the watershed moments, uh, we think was when Amazon bought Whole Foods. Um, hmm. And, you know, you sort of go, you know, well, what does that have to do with B2B commerce? You know, that's nothing to do with selling, you know, vacuum pumps or MRO supplies or, you know, whatever. I, I think that was sort of the, the final nail in the coffin of, um, you know, thinking that there's any part of the economy where this isn't going to be relevant. So if a bookstore can buy a grocery store. Yeah. So you think it's because it's like, okay, if you can buy food online and that's moving online and that's, that's a perishable thing, like what else, like pretty much everything can be sold online at this point. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, three things have, have sort of come together. Um, one, um, you know, and most importantly, it's the customer expectation. So, uh, the people doing the buying or at least a significant portion of them, you know, are digital natives at this point. Um, and you know, they've grown up with an expectation that they can gather information that they can, uh, you know, execute transactions online and to not have it is, you know, a little bit of cognitive dissonance. Uh, I mean, you know, think about it in your personal life. Uh, you know, how often do you, if you're getting food delivered, do you call the restaurant at this point? Yeah. I mean, we just literally, we just did Uber Eats at the office. I mean, we've done probably too much Uber Eats at the office at this point. <laughs> well, we all, have, we all have to, uh, you know, you know, the, the quarantine 15 is a real thing, but, um, <laughs> you know, you know, at this point, you know, you, if you're looking to get takeout from a restaurant and they, you can't do it online. It's almost, you know, a question of, oh, okay, well, do I actually really want to get it from there? I got to talk to somebody on the phone. I got to read out my credit card number. You know, customer expectation has, uh, ha has driven, uh, this, they, they want to, and if you can't do it, you know, you're going to at least open up the question in your customer's mind of, um, you know, are you, uh, you know, are you the people they want to do business with? Yeah. You know, I, t I so totally I think, agree. Yeah. So that, that's the first piece. The second piece is, um, you know, I, I think a, a better realization that, uh, you know, if an organization is just about relationships, that's not a defensible position. And you have to be present in, you know, in multiple channels. And, and if you go back, you know, a long time, you know, Forrester would call in the term multi-channel and then multi-channel became omni-channel. And I think I once, you know, saw somebody refer to it as ultra channel. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think you could probably, you know, keep throwing, uh, words you know, at it, but it's all pretty much the same thing. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't think people think of it as channel. I think of it as, you know, it, it, people have recognized that the, the channel isn't the important part. The value you're providing to your customers is the important part, but you better be able to meet the customers where they are. And so, so to your point, you, you think that historically a lot of B2B companies are like, oh, we have the best relationships with these key companies and that's no longer, you know, enough to stay competitive because your customers might say, oh, I can just go on Amazon and get this thing. Or they're starting to realize that they can go other places and get things more conveniently. It, it's, it, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so, you know, having those relationships, incredibly important. Um, having uh, a you know, a good set of relationships with your customers, very important. Being easy to do business with, very important. Um, especially, you know, at the more complex end, having, uh, you know, providing knowledge along with product, very important. Um, but none of those things, you know, will, will get you there if your customers can't interact with you with minimal friction in the way they want 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. Gotcha. So what's number three? I think that's number two. <laughs> <Or> <laughs> number three, number three is frankly, um, 
the technology has, you know, gotten to the place where it's, you know, it's meeting the promise. So, um, you know, part of the reason why, uh, you know, B2B commerce adoption lagged B2C um, is the, you know, the technologies that were appropriate for B2C e-commerce. And, and, you know, I, I could go do a half hour on why I don't love the terms B2C and B2B to start yeah. with, but <laughs> I'll, save that. I'll save that for a different day. Um, you know, the technology were generally focused on the B2C use cases. So, you know, the simple way to look at that is if you can put it in a box and get it to the customer via FedEx, you know, there's been great technology available for that. You know, all of those problems have been solved, you know, for the last 10 years. Yep. Totally so, agree. There's innovation in terms of, there's innovations in terms of the back end, in terms of how you do merchandising, and in terms of, you know, how you make the system, you know, prettier. But, you know, the core of that problem was solved you know, years ago. Um, it's only more recently that, um, you know, the, the use cases that the technology support have really got into maturity to support a lot of, you know, the more complex use cases. So configuration, uh, variable uh, or contract pricing, um, the ability to, you know, manage fulfillment across uh, you know, multiple delivery methods and multiple warehouses, the ability to um, have, you know, mirror customers purchasing rules. Um, you know, those were all things that you would, you know, if you're going back five, 10 years, you would take a piece of B2C technology and then start grafting that on top of. Today, more and more of those, uh, you know, those use cases are covered in a mature way in the, in the technologies. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, Magento actually just launched, uh, I think it was like yesterday or the day before, uh, like the newest edition 2.4, like the newest version, and they finally added order approval, like budgeting and order approval and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, I think they actually bought that from someone and kind of like wrapped it in, but so we'll see how good it actually is. It'll probably take a couple, couple iterations before it's like really perfected, but I do feel pretty confident that they finally kind of got to a point where like, pretty much like the main requirements that we see for the average B2B are now all in their kind of enterprise edition now that they've added this order approval. If you assume that that's working perfectly, um, you know, they've got, you know, company accounts and that whole functionality. They've, they've, they've basically like transitioned from more of a B2C company to really, I would consider like we look at them as more of a B2B e-commerce platform uh, than a B2C platform um, at this point in there. In, uh, uh yeah, I don't think that's wrong. Um, I, and again, I, I'm going to, you know, you know, sort of, uh, you know, unaccept the, the premise of this podcast that it's about B2B commerce, because I don't necessarily think, uh, you know, B2C and B2B are the right way to look at it. I, I tend to more, you know, look at things as simple and complex. So, you know, simple commerce, again, anything you can, you know, put in a box. Great. <laughs> Complex is all the business model. So that's, you know, traditional B2B, what you think of, of, um, you know, industrial manufacturer selling, uh, you know, something big or small to, you know, another industrial company. Um, it can be hybrid models. It can be B2B to C. It can be selling through distribution. So B2B to B. Um, it can be uh, multi-level. It can be, uh, complex subscription. I mean, there's a lot of uh, really interesting use cases, um, you know, that can be enabled. Uh, I, I totally yeah. agree. Um, and the reason we called this the hard truth about B2B e-commerce, um, I think you're right. We could probably call it like the hard truth about complex commerce or just complex e-commerce podcast, because, you know, that's kind of really what we're getting into is there's a lot of podcasts out there around like, oh, you know, let's do some Facebook marketing for e-commerce or just talk about Shopify and some of these like pretty, in my opinion, simple use cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about B2B e-commerce, what we're really talking about is, is complexity of pricing, ERP integration, things that could, could apply to B2C and also things in B2C that could apply to B2B. Like vice, they, they both kind of go hand in hand. And I think one of the things that we've talked a lot about on the podcast is that there's 
it's no no longer really B to C or B to B anymore. It's just kind of like a spectrum, like from the really simple use cases to the really really complex ones, which might be like large customers or or government or something like that, where you have like really complex ordering processes and integrations to get those people to order. Um, and we're kind of focused on the the second half of that spectrum, like the the complex part. Um, and the other reason we called it the hard truth about B2B e-commerce is because typically most manufacturers and distributors who are the majority of these B2B companies that are trying to move into e-commerce, uh, they're in the other half of that complexity spectrum. Like they're, and they don't, I don't think they fully realized it. Like you said, they I think people are realizing that they have to do e-commerce, but I don't think they've realized what it takes to get the, that second half of complexity to be successful. Like we just had a conversation with someone who's like, yeah, our budget, they were on Magenta 1.x and their their budget, he was trying to get to 2.x or, or basically like revamp their platform for less than 50,000. And they had a pretty complex ERP integration, you know, tens of thousands of products. And I was just like, ah, you know, maybe there's someone out there can, that can do it, but it's probably not Trellis. And it's definitely not Gorilla Group. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think there's just kind of a, a lack of reality in a lot of these organizations. And that's part of what we're trying to, to bring to the table is like, it, it still is complex, but yes, the technology is getting there, but it's still complex, you know, use cases to implement. Yeah, it is. And I mean, realistically, um, you know, the, the organizations, you know, I, I think probably if I wanted to add a, a fourth piece is that, you know, the idea of doing e-commerce is, you know, fully at this point moved out of IT and into, you know, a core, uh, a core goal for most businesses. So if you look at it as an IT project, you know, okay, well, we got to buy software, we got to hire consultants, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. Um, that's not the right way to start looking at the business case. Um, you know, the business case becomes, you know, has to include, you know, do you have the ability to get market share or is this going to be necessary to defend market share? Um, what portions of this, uh, you know, make sense to digitize and what don't? And it may not, you know, it may not be that the, the place where the best ROI is putting this onto a website. It may be assistive technologies. It may be um, enabling punch out. It may be sales order automation. It may be, um, you know, a number of different things, but you've got to look at it holistically. You've got to look at the business case holistically. You've got to look at both the upside and the downside. Um, and, you know, if there's any organization where, you know, one person owns the website as, you know, from a business point of view and somebody else owns the rest of, uh, you know, the, the quote to cash process, there's probably a misalignment. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it, and it kind of gets us into some of the topics that I wanted to discuss, um, which is, um, so we're kind of going to jump around here a little bit, but um, you bring up the point of having it's, it's become its own discipline. And I think that's very important and something that we've talked a lot about, which is, let's say you're trying to scale B2B e-commerce. Um, it sounds like you, you kind of agree with what we've been talking about a lot on this podcast, where you really need to like kind of create your own department around e-commerce because they're going to tie into IT. They're going to tie into sales. They're going to tie into marketing. They're kind of like the intersection between all the departments in a way. And if you, if you don't do that, it'll just get siloed into IT or it'll get siloed into some area and, and never really kind of like unify the company or get its maximum potential. Yeah, I mean, there, there has to be, um, you know, again, e-commerce itself isn't magic. You know, if you build it, that doesn't mean they'll come. Um, you know, that works in Kevin Costner movies, but, you know, not in our business. Um, you know, the places where, you know, we see it being most successful is when it's viewed as an enabling technology for things that the organization is already doing, which, you know, means that it needs to be business driven. It needs to be multidisciplinary. Um, you know, it can't, uh, you know, it, it can't just be an IT led initiative. Yeah. I think great. most people are, I think most people are there. Gotcha. Um, 
And then uh, in terms of, so, you know, at Grilla, you guys became pretty focused on B2B. And I think you mentioned that probably more than 50% of your projects uh, ended up as B2B, like uh, as, the, as the organization grew. Um, so as a digital, you know, for, for, for both merchants working with digital agencies, so they know what to avoid with a digital agency and for digital agencies, what, what do you think, um, you know, leads to success or failure um, in, in B2B e-commerce, um, like what do, what do you see kind of like happening in digital agencies that is maybe wrong or could be corrected? <laughs> yep. um, so, you know, I'll sort of answer this from the perspective of an agency, but I think it's also um, an equally good point from the point of view of a customer. Um, so the key to, you know, having a successful outcome if you're gonna invest in B2B commerce is you know working with a partner who understand who can understand your business because again the goal of you know uh, of these projects is not to stand up magento or hybris or netsuite commerce or insight or whatever right that's you know that that's a big part of it and you need somebody who understands the technology and you need somebody who uh you know has the right, uh, you know, the right engineers and, you know, the right, uh, uh, you know, smart people to do that. But that's not the goal. The goal is to, you know, the goal is the goal. The goal is to increase market share, defend against uh, uh, share erosion from competitors who are easier to do business with, yep. reduce cost, you know, better serve your customers, reduce cycle time, et cetera, et cetera. That's the goal, right? So if you are working with a partner who um, you know, sees the goal of standing up the technology, you're a lot less likely to be successful than if you're working with a partner who understands what your business is trying to do and can meet you there. So to be successful, the key is having people who understand um, you know, how this works as part of the business. And it's not just, you know, the other thing I think you know, the other way to phrase that is I think a lot of agencies make the mistake of viewing their involvement uh, within the bubble of the system, right? We're going we're gonna to draw a diagram that says this is where data comes into the e-commerce system and this is where it, it leaves the e-commerce system. And, you know, we're responsible for what happens in that bubble. And that is absolutely true from a technology point of view. But, you know, that's like saying, uh, you know, that's like being a personal trainer and saying I'm only responsible for you know, the left lung. Um, you have to understand how that fits into the context. You have to understand how that data is going to get created. Um, and, you know, if there's going to be issues with that, you know, work with your customer that to make sure that those are being solved, whether you're solving them or somebody else's. If there's going to be issues with uh, what happens after the order is taken, uh, the whole the whole process needs to work start to end and company you know agencies that understand that and start with that assumption are going to deliver much better outcomes to their customers yeah and so that's, a really good, outcomes. that's a really good point I, I, I you know just to summarize for people you know on the merchant side or the or the agency side cause you kind of look at it together is you know you need to come together you know as the true partnership on the agency and the customer side and say, okay, we're going to look at this holistically. Like, here's how we're going to, how, here's how our product data goes into the ERP. You know, that's how it goes into, you know, the e-com system, you know, here's how we're going to augment that to maybe add some data to make it look pretty on the, on the front end, like basically the whole flow. And here's how sales reps are going to use the website so that they still get their commission. Um, so there's kind of a unified, approach to this entire project so that it's going to be successful and the end result isn't just a website that technically does what they said requirements wise it actually like helps the organization move forward and so that's really what you would say is kind of the, the key drivers of success working together as an agency and merchant and then um you see a lot of that just failing falling down i'm guessing uh, yeah i do and i mean you know, you've done a lot of B2B projects. I've done a lot of B2B projects. What are the common things, you know, that, you know, cause them to, if not fail, you know, get into trouble, take longer, cost more, not produce the results? Well, you know, the, the biggest one or probably the most common is we don't have the right uh, catalog information 
to make the system work the way we want. So yeah. you know, we went out and we we brought in the UX people and they built beautiful pages and we brought in the technology people and they they built a high performing you know website that you know is always on and you know has you know great page response speeds and whatnot, right? And you know, we implement it, you know, we put together a checkout that's easy for people to use and we've done all those things, right? Great. Um, but we don't have the product data. We don't have the right uh, enhancement content. The stuff isn't attributed well, so the search doesn't work. Um, and what our customers need to do is they get on, they can't find the products they're looking for or they can't get the information they need to uh, yeah. make a first decision because they can't decide if they need a this or that. And all of a sudden they're back on the phone with us. Yeah, so essentially it's a useless application in that sense. And I, I totally agree with that. And that's why I think a, a lot of um, my recommendations to companies that are still you know, in the earlier stages, like maybe they're only doing 5% or 10% online or, or even less, um, or even you know below 20% online, is to focus on just you know product data and good kind of operational, um, you know, workflow that mimics kind of what your customer would expect. So that would mean like accurate pricing. So when I say accurate pricing, I don't mean like just the list price. I mean their negotiated price on the website. So you know, I think those are to me those are the two main things that we see is they don't have all the products and all the inventory and the correct kind of like product data to buy and then they don't have the correct pricing. So if, they, if you can call and get better pricing, why would you ever order online? And so if those two things aren't working, then you're just not going to have adoption, you know? Exactly. So, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a, if you're the uh, person who, you know, if you're the manufacturer distributor or, or whatever looking to do this, you know, the, the first step is thinking through what are the, you know, what are the processes? So, the other way to look at that is where is somebody manually interacting? You know, if, if we're doing quotes, does somebody have to go pull out a calculator or a piece of paper or fill out a form? Okay. Um, you know, where is the knowledge? You know, if some of that knowledge is in people's heads to be successful, we're going to have to pull that out. All these things are doable. I mean, again, none of, you know, there's, uh, you know, there, there's companies that are doing billions through their website. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, you know, millions of transactions. Yeah. And, you know, it's all doable, but you have to approach it holistically. You have to approach it from, you know, a business and process view, not a technology view. And you have to, you know, pick your partner uh, intelligently. So the, the ability for them to implement the technology is important. Obviously, if you hire a partner who can't make the technology work, you're not going anywhere, but that's table stakes. So, yeah. you know, if, if I were hiring an agency, the first thing I would do is, you know, I'd check off that they really do know the technology. That's important, right? Then I'd check off to make sure that they're going to be a good partner and help understand my business and bring yeah, original yeah. thinking. I, the other so thing I, you don't want is an agency that just says, okay, how do you do it today? Great. We'll go try to replicate that online because that's probably not right either. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's funny you say that because I think that's a big problem in the industry at least from my perspective and, and our perspective might be a little biased there but i feel like there's a resistance from most um b2b companies to listen to their agencies about things outside of the core technology and e-commerce because they've been doing things for a certain way and it's hard for them to go oh this like e-com agency is telling me i gotta like change all my processes like what do they know? They just know like Magento or they know Shopify. Like how do they know about B2B e-commerce? So I think that there's needs to be a little bit of a culture shift there where companies are starting to go, Oh, like this agency isn't just my, you know, tech agency. They're also my B2B e-com agency, which might help influence our processes and help us automate and become more efficient. And, and I don't think that's happening as much as it should be. Right. And I, and that, I mean, frankly, I think you're right. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, if you go to the doctor, um, you know, you, you, you listen to the doctor, uh, <laughs> and you don't sit there and go, uh, you know, doctor, I only want you to, you know, solve the things on the left side of my body. Uh, <laughs> but on the flip side, you know, you know, as agency types, you know, we need to, you know, we need to get better at, at, you know, working with our customers to understand that that's where the value comes from. And, 
um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we can fall into the trap of positioning ourselves as the e-commerce people or the technology people or the Magento people or the Shopify people or the hybrids people. And that's, you know, that's putting us in a box in the customer's mind. Um, and then if we're not bringing the right, uh, you know, insights and knowledge to the table, we're going to, you know, seal ourselves into that box and tape it up. And, um, you know, there, there's a better way. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And you kind of uh, mentioned in the beginning of the episode, like, I think all e-commerce agencies have a little bit of an identity cr uh, crisis where like, you know, do you say you're a Magento agency? Do you say you're a Shopify agency? Do you say you're an e-commerce agency? Like, it, it, it's very hard not to put yourself in some sort of boxes because you want to start to get, you know, traffic and 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 uh, momentum in a certain area but once you do that you might alienate other you know value adds that you actually are providing so um it's definitely something that i think we have to think more about and and, and figure out but um one of the other things that i think um is part of the problem here is we've been we've actually built a pretty uh close-knit partnership with an erp integrator um they're actually in massachusetts so that's kind of how we got together because we're both local and we had done a joint project and then now we've been partnering more and more together um and it's been very eye-opening it's we've learned a lot about b2b e-commerce from them um and the reason for that is because i think historically and, and still today the companies the most b2b companies when they're going back to trusting processes and and how processes should should work is it seems like they're mostly trusting their ERP vendors. Like most of their processes run through their ERP, let's call it SAP, NetSuite, or Infor, or whatever. They generally hire a vendor, you know, some gold partner from one of these companies. And that partner is generally the one guiding the processes. Like here's, you know, here's the best practice for running SAP and how you should run B2B processes. And there's a big disconnect between those companies and e-commerce from what I'm seeing in the market. And I think there needs to be some sort of mar better marrying of the two. Um, and you're starting to see a little bit of that happen, but I don't, I think it's still kind of early stages. And again, sort of, you know, putting on the, the you know, the agency hat, you know, I think there's actually a fair amount that we can learn um, from, you know, the ERP uh, service providers. Um, you know, you know, I, I, I started my career in that world and, you know, have done some along the way as well. And, um, you know, generally the, the process there is going to be, you know, business and process driven. And that's the way they, you know, that's the way they plan. That's the way they build projects. That's the way they interact with their customers. And that's, I think that's right now, you know, vice versa, you know, we, we tend to come at things from, you know, more of the, you know, call it agile um, or, you know, agency process where, um, you know, it's not necessarily as much of a, a big bang approach. So there's things that, uh, you know, there, there's a happy medium. Um, but I think that, you know, having, uh, I used to love to hire people with ERP implementation background to do e-commerce projects um, because, you know, we can, we can always teach you the technology. Um, you know, what we can't necessarily, you know, teach as quickly is the ability to solve problems from a holistic point of view. And, you know, if you've, you know, if you've ever implemented, you know, especially, you know, ground up in ERP for, uh, you know, for a company, you're going to understand their business. You have to. Yeah. You have to understand how they process orders. Like you're, you're understanding the very basic level of how they make money <laughs> yep. and how they, how they succeed. Um, so I know, I know you got a, the hard stop coming up. So, so um, a couple of things I wanted to touch on before, before we, we wrap up. Um, so what do you, what do you think uh, merchants should be learning from, from B2C and this, you know, call it 10, 20 years of e-commerce that now, now we're actually at like 30, I mean, it, it jumped from like 15 to like 30% because of coronavirus. <laughs> um, and I think B2B e-commerce is still lagging a little bit behind. So I think it's definitely not at the 30% that B2C is at. So what, what are you seeing kind of like as the next phase of growth in B2B e-commerce and what can they learn? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think the basic lessons have been learned. You know, the idea that 
you know, you're going to have an experience that's meaningfully, you know, different in terms of quality from, you know, B2C experience. I, you know, I, I think we're past that point. You know, people have uh, internalized that customers' expectations are, are, are set by, you know, the experiences that they have in their, in their day-to-day life. And, you know, the idea that, they're going to be accepting of a poor experience or poor performance because this is work. Um, you know, I, I don't find that I've had to have that conversation as much recently. So that's good. Um, the, um, you know, the next piece of it, I think is, you know, understanding that again, if you're looking at it holistically, there may be different, portions. And, and one of the mistakes that I think we've sort of seen the sweat, the pendulum, you know, swing a little too far towards is, um, okay, well, we weren't sure if this was important. We weren't sure if we needed to do this. We, you know, oh my God, now we really need to do it. Right. And, you know, <laughs> the, the current, uh, you know, everything going on in the world today, I think is probably just, you know, more gas on that fire. Um, so, you know, the, you know, the pendulum swing from this is really hard. We don't really know how to break this problem apart to, okay, well now we know we need to do it. So let's solve the whole problem. Right. Mm. Um, and where you, you know, land up getting in trouble there is this is complex stuff. You're selling medical devices, you're selling regulated products, you're selling configurable products, you're selling, you know, both uh, OEM goods as well as, you know, replacement and, and service parts. You know, you're selling through distribution. These are all, you know, these are all hairy problems. Um, and I think the, um, you know, the idea that it has to be solved holistically and all at once is pr- probably where we need to swing the pendulum a little bit back to the middle. That's partially, um, you know, that's partially education, that's partially customer expectation setting, and then partially is customer culture. You know, if you have places that are uh, used to um, change and innovation and, and open to uh, incremental change, uh, it tends to be a lot easier than places where, um, you know, the, the incentive is for everybody to make sure they get everything they need in the first phase because they don't ever believe there's going to be a phase two. So, um, you know, another piece, the way to say that is I would always counsel people to look at this as an ongoing process, not a one-off project. Yeah. If you look at it as a one-off project, you're going to tell everyone that you're going to tell your, you know, your salespeople and your revenue people and your invoicing people and your customer service people that they better load up the Christmas tree right now and get everything they ever want. And, uh, that's not the best way to do this. Yeah. And so do you think that B2B, I, I, I guess just empirically from the evidence that we've seen, it seems like B2B is more likely to try and do that because they just, that's how they kind of operate. And they maybe, especially from the ERP world, we do an ERP upgrade once every five, 10 years. So if we're going to do it, we're going to do this like big giant project. Um, whereas with e-commerce, it's not the, not really as successful that way, especially things that are moving so fast. You need to be agile and adapt and, and improve. So it seems like B2C has started to learn that and, and has become more agile generally. Um, obviously there's always exceptions, but most B2C companies we see are like, okay, let's start with this and then let's add this. And then they kind of like build this roadmap that they're working to and B2B hasn't quite figured out this kind of like agile roadmap as, as well as I think they, they need to. So I, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't over general. I think a lot of companies have, are doing a really great job with that. I think you, you still, run across places where that's not the case. And, you know, that's, you know, part of, you know, our job on the, on the service provider world is to, you know, is to be smart about educating our customers and, and, and again, meeting them where they are, making sure that we understand their incentives, but, um, you know, being clear where, you know, this is how you're going to be more successful. And even if that means we're not the right partner for you today, or this isn't the right time, or this isn't, uh, you know, we're going to do something small before we do something big. That's okay. I think, uh, you know, there, you know, in, in our industry, in the agency world, there are a lot of people who, you know, will say yes, 
you know, customer asks for something green, they're going to get something green. If they ask for it purple, they're going to get purple. Um, and that's not, you know, that's doing a disservice to your customer. Um, and I would argue doing a disservice to your agency in the long term. Gotcha. Yeah. So there, there needs to be some, some, some changes there and some expectation setting. Um, so, uh, we got a little bit of time here. So a couple, a uh, couple more questions, um, that I have are, what do you, what do you see as like some of the core, um, differentiators that you see kind of being important to B2B that maybe aren't so common in B2C, um, and where, you know, to add to that, like, where would you see, you know, the focus be for B2B if you were kind of in the early stages? So we talked about product data, we talked about pricing a little bit, but, you know, I think there's more to it in the B2B world. The, the you know, those are two of the very important parts. Um, obviously being, you know, being able to uh, digitize the, the business process or whatever, you know, whatever steps around purchasing, whatever steps around, uh, you know, uh, rules and, you know, availability and, uh, you know, available to promise and inventory and, and, you know, uh, shipment dates, all that kind of, you know, business process stuff has to be there. That's table stakes. The third piece, um, you know, the third major piece though, um, is more around content and discovery. So, I mean, especially on the, you know, more complex end, the, you know, the process of making the sale isn't just placing the order. Um, it's, you know, ensuring that, you know, your customers can make the right decision. Um, and, you know, that involves content. It can involve the ability to do configuration and comparison. It can uh, involve, uh, you know, the, you know, the data that people need to, to make something usable. It can involve, you know, a hybrid process that includes, uh, you know, both, you know, digital and, uh, and human experiences. Um, and, you know, looking at what are the steps in your customer's journey to make a purchase decision, you know, a lot of times what you're going to find is the customer needs to know that it's the right product, um, mm -hmm. or the right solution. And, um, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not building that into the experience, then all you've really created is a, you know, pretty order form. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, you know, you could look at it as right now, there's still a lot of companies that need a better pretty order form per se. Mm -hmm. Like they, they need to automate more of their orders, which at a, at a really basic way, that's really what B2B e-commerce, you know, is to, to some degree is just making it so that your customers can kind of do the orders themselves instead of having to call in or send a PO. They can go online get their pricing, get everything, you know, and, and, and buy uh, right. and even hopefully get their shipment dates and correct inventory. Yeah. But then that next level is this whole content discovery. Are they ordering the right things or they even know what you have? They might not even know that you have, you know, 20 more products that might help their business. Yeah. I mean, the first piece of that is important and it's making you easier to work with and it's, you know, uh, you know, frankly, probably reducing cost and increasing customer satisfaction, but that's not going to, you know, that's not going to help you expand your market or gain market share. That's going to help you defend. So yeah. I, I totally agree. And I think that's a, also a culture shift that needs to happen. And we had a, uh, a lead that came in from a, from a partner and, you know, decent business, uh, decent sized business. Um, but their budget just wasn't there for what they were asking. And, um, the way that they were looking at the project was very it. I think it was the it. I can't remember what his title was, but it was very, uh, this is going to replace one customer service person. So that's how much we're going to budget for it. Like that was how they looked at the project. And in my mind, I'm like, I mean, this could be like, he didn't even, they didn't even think about marketing or sales or, you know, just even like the basic Google search aspect of things. I mean, SEO is obviously a big component that could, could help a lot of these companies. So uh, I try to kind of convince him otherwise, but I think that's where it's challenging because you need to talk to other people in the company. Like he's probably not the marketing guy. So someone else needs to be in that conversation. Uh, you should tell the tell the IT guys if, if what they're looking to do is free up you know customer service or inside sales people's time. Check out Connexium. We can, <laughs> we, we can do that. Yeah, real well. I think that's a great point. You know, we need to start uh, sending them your way, and then you know, once you guys have solved that problem, and you know they need some more sales and marketing, you can say, hey, go back to go back to the agencies to actually grow your business. <laughs> well, it really is. I mean, it really is part of the same coin. Again, what you're you're not 
you know, your e-commerce customer isn't necessarily different from, you know, your other customers. And, um, you know, you, you want to be looking at how you're, how you're making yourself a modern business. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, that's why companies like Connexium, companies like punch out to go and companies like, uh, you know, trellis, you know, are all parts of the solution and can all work together. Absolutely. Like I said, that's why I think we're all trying to kind of raise, raise the tide here. So I don't look at it as a, uh, honestly competition, even some of our direct com competitors sometimes. Um, so the last question I have, what do you see kind of in the, you know, you've been doing this for, for over 20 years now um, in the e-commerce space. Um, what do you see kind of in the next five to 10 years in B2B e-commerce? I know it's, it's pretty hard to, to predict these kind of things, but what are some of the things if you had to take a, take a stab at it? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think I sort of alluded to this one. One, I think, you know, in, in the companies where this isn't already true, and a lot of people are already here, um, I, I think it, this is going to become viewed as a, a core business function uh, rather than an IT driven uh, uh, or, you know, even a, or an e-commerce department. I think that, you know, part is probably, you know, this is going to become, again, just like anything else, it, it's core to the business. So the revenue leaders, the you know, the product owners, the business owners are going to, you know, going to get a lot more interested in this. I think we'll continue to see the technology mature um, to the point where um, it's a lot more possible to bring, you know, off the shelf technology to enable complex use cases. Mm, um, yeah. More configuration yeah. and, you know, less of customization, more like, hey, look, we're going to actually just configure yeah. the software. Yeah. I think um, headless approaches will, you know, from a technology point of view, will become increasingly uh, you know, prevalent in the B2B world as well. Um, you know, it, it's funny, you know, uh, sort of the headless pattern actually, you know, is the first sort of new technology pattern in e-commerce in my 20 years of doing it that really actually starts to, you know, usually technologies, you know, come in and they first get applied to the B2C world and then we try to figure out how to how to apply them to the B2B world. I think, you know, headless as a pattern goes the other direction. Cause um, you're, you can bring in so many different systems more seamlessly and B2B typically has, so I totally agree. There's more value probably from a B2B perspective. So yeah, no, those are all really, really good points. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, you're going to see, yeah. Sorry, continue. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, the last thing is I think you're going to see, you know, the, you know, the agencies, the good ones, uh, like trellis, um, you know, really, uh, you know, make this a, a core specialty rather than, um, you know, a, a, a something we do sometimes. And I think that is important. I, I totally agree. You know, we've kind of been splitting up uh, some of our strategies and even personnel and, and, you know, obviously, like you said, there's a spectrum, so it's tough to put people in a B2B versus B2B, B2C bucket, but, there are, you know, um, skill sets there that you, you do need to specialize in. So uh, totally, totally agree with that. Uh, well, thank you so much. We're, we're at the end of the hour. Um, so for all of you uh, that don't know Justin, how, how can they get in touch with you at Connexium? So, you know, they want to get rid of that cu customer service person. Sorry, uh, or not get rid of them, maybe uh, replace them, put them in a new department. <laughs> get, them, get, them, get them, you know, spending their time on more high value things. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so you can, you know, you can, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can get me at jfinnegan at connexium.com. You can come to my house, you know. A little bit of <laughs> so great, great. Uh, check out Connexium. It's a, it's a great tool in the B2B space. Uh, thank you for joining and for all of you, uh, you know, who are staying tuned to the podcast, come back for episode 15 with Lori McDonald. Um, she's been in B2B e-commerce for a while and we're going to have some great stuff to talk about um, with her. So thank you so much, Justin. All right. Thanks, Isaiah. Take care. Thank you.